justice reform in the state without uh, discussing Ferguson, and I'm not you know, necessarily referring specifically to the Mike Brown, Darren Wilson case that's currently before the grand jury. And uh, I'll tell you, when people were saying that, that the, the, the decision might be handed down this week, I was kind of panicking because I was like, what happens if that comes out on a Saturday uh, or Friday and we have this scheduled here? Who knows what happens? So I'm, I'm just kind of relieved that we uh, that the, the decision has not yet come down. Uh, but you know, this this case represents the reason that there was such an outcry is because there was there's just a fundamental mistrust between the police and the policed in many of our communities in this country. Uh, and so I think it behooves us to look at what the causes of that mistrust are, and also what we can do to to fix those uh, those problems. Uh, so we have a panel up here to, to discuss that. Uh, we have Radley Balco, uh, who uh, was just moderated the last panel, and uh, he's with the Washington Post, has written a few very, very good articles about St. Louis County and how the municipal court system there is just basically stealing money from uh, from its poorest citizens. Uh, and then Ray Hartman, who is the, he founded the, uh, the Rural Front Times, and now he's the uh, publisher and editor of the St. Of St. Louis Magazine. Uh, and then Kenny Murdoch, who hosts a uh, show on WGNU, is also very active with the NAACP here in Missouri. So I'd like to start with Radley, uh, and just, you know, how, how is it that St. Louis County and the municipal court system is essentially, you know, leeching off its poorest citizens, uh, and also what role do minor drug offenses play in that, uh, in that system? So um, I lived in St. Louis for about a year and a half. I, I uh, did a brief, brief flirtation with law school uh, and um, dropped out. Um, and uh, I'd like to say I went and gave a talk at my former law school as a dropout a couple years ago, which was a satisfying experience. Um, <laughs> in any case, I got a, a call from a friend of mine right after the, floor, the, the Ferguson stuff started to blow up, um, who's an attorney here in town. Uh, and he had been representing some of the people who were had been caught up in the municipal court system here. Uh, and he started to tell me, you know, pitched this idea of me coming and writing a story about this. And it was, um, this friend tends to exaggerate things, um, and uh, I wasn't quite sure it was going to be worth the trip. Um, I drove up here, started talking to people, and I got to tell you, um, I've done a lot of reporting in uh, the deep south and, you know, sort of backwater towns of Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, I've seen, you know, some pretty... Uh, um, uh, sort of fatalist uh, uh, communities with a, a very fatalist outlook about uh, the relationship with law enforcement and the criminal justice system. Um, I actually left St. Louis County very sort of overwhelmed and depressed uh, at what I had encountered in the few days I was here. Um, it's really kind of remarkable. You, you, when you think about how people can be screwed over by the criminal justice system, you tend to think about police raids, you tend to think about wrongful convictions, you know, wrongful executions, sort of the big, big ticket stuff, right? The, the scary stuff. Um, these people, you know, that I talk to, their uh, lives have been ruined by very sort of peddly, uh, uh, pissant, day-to-day -day, uh, misdemeanors. And it, you don't really sort of think of those crimes as, as having the capacity to destroy lives. Um, but that's exactly, you know, what's been happening in St. Louis County. And it's, um, it's a fascinating story, and I don't have time to sort of get into it all, but um, the one thing I, I, you know, race is, is a very pervasive part of the story, and I think the interesting thing about this is when we talk about race, I think there, the discussion tends to be sort of very uh, accusatory, and you sort of, I think um, uh, there's a certain segment of the white community that tends to be very offended when you start talking about how racism is still pervasive today. Um, what I found was really interesting is when I wrote this story, um, it didn't really get that kind of reaction at all. Um, maybe been some comments uh, in the comment section, but comment sections are always terrible. Um, but the reception, sort of even on the right and sort of the, the conservative, very conservative right, was uh, people were sort of aghast at what they saw. And I, th I think it, be, w when we frame these discussions properly, uh, we talk about historical racism and how historical racism has created uh, a structure of racism that, that that is pervasive today, even if the individual actors within that system aren't racist themselves, it still has a disproportionate effect on communities of color. Um, and I think that's a, a good way of framing these issues in a way that allows you to build coalitions for change, as opposed to sort of, you know, uh, 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 alienating people by sort of confronting race in a more kind of direct way. And I, th I don't think it's dis dis inaccurate or dishonest. I mean, what happened in St. Louis County basically is that um, over the years, as uh, in the early 20th century, whites fled the city and moved into the suburbs. 
uh, as the black working class accumulated a little more wealth, they also started to flee the city. And whites responded basically by continuing to flee further. Um, and you would, what they would do is they would sort of try to keep blacks out of the communities by moving west uh, or south, in some cases north, uh, and they would, uh, you know, you would, you would create this sort of subdivision or new housing division. Uh, and then in order to keep black people out, you would either, you know, well, before Brown versus Board, you would do something explicitly racist, um, pass an explicitly segregationist law. After Brown uh, and similar court rulings, you would use zoning laws. Uh, and so you would zone your entire community uh, as single family housing only, uh, which would basically keep the black community out of your neighborhood. Uh, but in order to do that, you would have to incorporate. Uh, you'd have to become a city in order to oppose that kind of zoning law. Uh, so basically, you would have these tiny little communities that would uh, incorporate as a city, pass these zoning laws. Eventually, sort of black people would move into those areas, the white people would pick up and move west uh, and repeat the process again. And this is why you have 92 separate municipalities in St. Louis County, uh, and it's why you have, I believe, 80 separate courtrooms and 80 separate police departments. Well, how does that affect things today? Well, the, the way it affects things today is that each one of those towns has its own uh, city council it has its own mayor, has its own city hall, and has its own municipal court, it has its own police department. All those people have to be paid. Um, and so the way they get paid, well, the primary way that these cities make money and these tiny towns make money is through the property tax. Um, but that's then supplemented by these fines that they impose on people uh, at the municipal level. Um, perversely, the poorer the town, uh, the less money they're going to be making from property taxes, which means the more reliant they're going to be on these municipal courts to extract money from their poor citizens. And so what you end up getting is um, these really horrible situations where the cops basically exist. And, and keep in mind, if, if it's a serious crime, uh, you know, a high-level drug crime, a murder, a rape, it's usually the St. Louis County Police that, that take these cases, uh, or even in some cases the state police. Uh, so you have these towns that have the police departments whose sole purpose uh, is to extract money uh, from the citizens of these these towns uh, in order to fund the town's very existence and, and to fund the, the officers' paychecks. Now, think about what that does uh, to rel the relationship between the citizens of these towns and the police, right? Um, in a lot of cases, the police don't live in these towns. They're from other parts uh, of the county. Uh, they tend to be from wealthier parts of the county. Um, the, I think the Post-Dispatch did a, a front page story showing the racial disparity in these police departments. And, you know, I don't think that a police department has to have the exact racial sort of demographic of, as the city, uh, but it does have to be reasonably close, right? Uh, I think a community needs to see themselves reflected in the police force that polices them. And I think it's important that the police see themselves in the community. Uh, otherwise, the community sees the, the, the police as the sort of occupying force of people who don't live there, who are being imposed upon them, uh, and the police look at the town as these sort of others that you know they're supposed to be extracting money from and keeping in line. Um, so you get this very antagonistic relationship, and when it's one where uh, the, the residents of these towns don't want to cooperate with the police, they don't even want to interact with them, uh, and where the police see people not as citizens with rights, but basically as sources of revenue, uh, and this is how they're 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 instructed uh, basically to do their jobs. And so you, you know, it, it exists in uh, perversely again because the, the, weird, the way the budget numbers or the, the economic numbers break down, it, it, the problem is much more pervasive in the poorer, blacker areas. This is true even in towns that have majority or even entirely black city councils and black mayors um, because those towns are going to be disproportionately poor and again disproportionately reliant on these these municipal courts. And so you have this situation there when a town like Beverly Hills, for example, um, where, you know, the town is basically run by African Americans, but because of this history uh, of structural racism that's been imposed and that the sort of scaffolding of this local government is steeped in this historical and structural racism, uh, you still have racism being imposed on the citizens of uh, Beverly Hills, even by its uh, mostly black government. So I just want to throw out a, a few statistics and then I'll, I'll pass it on to show you just how absurd does it become. And I'm going to have to just quote from my article here because article here, I don't remember them all. But um, So what happens is, is you go to these courts, these municipal courts, you get you know traffic tickets. We've got um, 
uh, you know, seatbelt violations, speeding, red light violations. Uh, we have one, one town, I believe it was uh, uh, Bell Ridge, was caught several years ago manipulating its red light to, to so they were, they were making the light, the, the green turn red very quickly to catch people as they were going through to generate revenue. You have these um, uh, occupancy permits where, you know, when you, I guess, when you move into a new town in St. Louis County, you have to go to City Hall and get an occupancy permit uh, for your residence. That costs money. Um, it lists how many people can be in your residence at any given time. If the police get called to your place for a noise violation or anything else, and there are more people there than are allowed in the occupancy permit, they can then write you up and they can find anybody who's there over the number on the permit. Well, what this does is basically allowed police in certain communities to enforce uh, these archaic laws against unmarried cohabitation. Um, and so there are cases where, you know, women have been written up because they had men over at their house uh, after midnight. Um, you know, they couldn't specifically write them up for that, but they could say this is a violation of your occupancy permit. Um, you have cases, uh, business code violations. I mean, basically there are these, you know, dozens and dozens of these ordinances that could be used. And of course, if you talk to an honest police officer, they'll tell you that anytime a cop pulls you over, they can find something to write you up for uh, if they want to. Um, the problem then is if you can't get into court to pay these fines, if you can't get into court because you have kids to worry about, um, you can then, uh, they'll then issue an arrest warrant for you. Um, the, uh, one of the, the Antonio Morgan's, one of the stories I tell in the articles, is a guy who, you know, was trying to start a business, was getting repeatedly harassed by officers in his neighborhood in, um, I believe it was, for, uh, what was it, Forest Hills, Forest, um, Forest Park, Park, yeah, uh, you know, racked up a lot of these arrest warrants, uh, at one point goes to the courtroom to, to pay his fine, and again, this is, this guy, no criminal violent, you know, no drug violations, no violent crimes, Basically, he's just got a pile of these sort of municipal uh, violations, municipal warrants. Goes to court, has his kids with him. Uh, just had picked his kids up from school. His, his wife uh, you know, hadn't been gotten home from work yet. Uh, he tries to take his kids into a courtroom. There's a sign on the, on the door that says no children are allowed in the courtroom. Leaves his kids in the truck, thinks he's just going to run in and pay his fine and come out. There's an officer in the parking lot. Uh, who sees that he left his kids in the truck, writes him up for child endangerment for leaving his kids in the truck while he goes in to pay the warrant. Now, if you think about it, if you're a poor person, how this affects you, um, you know, you're, every time you get one of these fines, you're going to have to find somebody to watch your kids or pay somebody to watch your kids. You can go to court to pay the fine. Uh, so it uh, affects them disproportionately hard. If you're wealthy enough to have an attorney, a lot of times you can get the fines waived, you can get them diminished. Um, if you have an attorney, the attorney can show up for you instead of you in these courts. Uh, if you can't afford an attorney, you have to show up on your own. Uh, the people who have attorneys get to go first in all of these courts because they don't, the courts don't want to waste the attorney's time. So you can see the, 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 the way that, the, 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 that these laws disproportionately affect poor people just sort of pile up on top of each other. All right, I promise you some statistics and then I'll, I'll shut up for a minute. Um, so let's look at some of these statistics. Um, All right, this is a ridiculously long article, so I've got to do a... Uh, so, um, <clears throat> the one I remember most is... Uh, well, actually, the first one that was reported was in Ferguson. Uh, I believe Ferguson ended up having, uh, I think it was over three arrest warrants per citizen. Uh, that were imposed by its municipal court. Uh, and people thought that one was really ridiculously high. Um, I started looking around, looking into the numbers that have been put out by Better Together and uh, some of the local uh, municipal courts. Um, so Cool Valley is a town of 1,200 people. It's 84.5% black. Uh, the court issued 1,871 arrest warrants uh, last year. So that's uh, basically 1.5 arrest warrants for every resident. But if you look at outstanding warrants from previous years in Cool Valley, um, there were just under 6,000. Uh, so you're looking at five outstanding arrest warrants for every citizen of uh, Cool Valley. Um, the, but it gets worse, uh, the town of, um, here we go. Um, as of June of 2013, there were 23,457 arrest warrants pending in Pine Lawn Municipal Court, or about 7.3 per resident. Uh, the court brought in more than $1.8 million for the town, or the municipal court itself brought in over $570 per resident uh, in 2013. 
Uh, that's about 4.5% of the average Pine Lawn resident's annual income. Uh, Pine Lawn is even the worst. Country Club Hills, uh, which is, you know, I love these, the town names, right? You can see, you can see sort of the history in the town name, right? This is Country Club Hills is a town in the north part of the county that's, uh, I believe it's 95% black. Um, you know, ironically enough, the country club that inspired the name probably didn't admit black people until only recently. Um, but there are 33,000 outstanding warrants uh, in Country Club Hills, or 26 warrants, outstanding arrest warrants per resident. Now, if you think about that, how in the world do these people, you know, how do you, how do you go on with your life when every time you get out in your car, every time you're on the street, uh, you're constantly paranoid that, you know, any interaction with the police officer is going to end up with your arrest uh, and you're going to be spending a lot of time in jail. Uh, you know, what, what's going to happen with your kids? You know, how long are you just been in jail? What, uh, what kind of bail are you going to have to raise? Who are you going to have to hit up in your family? Um, it becomes a very sort of uh, oppressive, pervasive part of the day-to-day -day lives to people who live in these communities. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize both the historical context uh, that got us here, but also this is how you, you, this is why we see the anger that we're seeing in Ferguson. Um, it's, it's, it's not just Michael Brown, it's, it's the sort of day-to-day uh, interactions that the people who live in these towns are having with police and the way it sort of prevents them from, you know, living their lives and having their families and trying to get their jobs and sort of having a day-to-day -day existence. Thank you, Radley. Uh, so just a couple of quick remarks before we move on to Ray. Uh, so I used to live in the village of Marlboro out in St. Louis County, which I'm pretty sure consists of my, the apartment complex I used to live in, a QT, a bowling alley, and City Hall. That is uh, literally the, the extent of it. Also, uh, and this is a, a, a stretch of, or not a stretch of a comparison, but an arcane comparison. Uh, so back when the Spanish conquered South America, uh, they used to refer to the citizens the, of you know, the, the former Inca Empire as the literal translation is pieces of silver with feet. Uh, and what that meant was they were, they were just used to extract revenue. Uh, and that's pretty much, uh, I think there's not just St. Louis County, but a lot of our, our governments currently look at, look at us as pieces of silver with feet. Uh, so, Ray, I'd like to, you know, you're pretty plugged into the, the political talking class uh, here around St. Louis. Uh, what do you, how do you assess the, uh, the possibility that some of these things are actually going to change, that we're going to see real reforms out of this, uh, out of the protests that are happening right now? Well, thank you. It was suggested I stand up, and this is usually the point at which somebody yells, stand up, Ray, after I'm up here. Um, thank you for having me, and uh, I guess I'll be the resident cynic here. Uh, the assigned topic here was uh, how, does, how does Ferguson change the criminal justice, uh, justice system, and my guess is how, how does it or how should it? How does it? Probably not at all. That's my sad take. Now, on a positive note, uh, I look out here and see Dan Veets, who when marijuana is legalized in Missouri, there needs to be a monument built for Dan. Uh, <laughs> for real. Now, Dan, and Dan more than I, but Dan and I go back to his days as student body president while I was student newspaper editor at Mizzou, and uh, I don't want to date myself, but I believe Dan and I have been fighting the war against those drugs that don't enjoy corporate sponsorship for uh, longer than any of the people here have been alive. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, over 40 years for sure. Um, you know, we don't know what's going to come out of Ferguson, uh, and and I will say that that any progress that is made in the short run in Missouri or Missouri is, is going to be about winning the hearts and minds of Republicans. With I know you got a panel coming up with some legislators, and I hope. And I don't mean to offend any of the Democratic legislators who are good enough to get here. I had actually heard that I, I may have read, I thought it was on the obit page that the Missouri Democratic Party had actually died. Um, uh, but with no disrespect to the good souls who are in the tiny minority in the Democratic Party, and we have a governor that has been, in my mind, worthless on this issue. And uh, so it's really about winning the hearts and minds of, of Republicans. But it can be done. When you look at the courageous police officers who are willing to stand up, and you saw the last panel, it can be done. It can be done in terms of, it has to be done in terms of Republican issues, and I don't want to get too off the subject, but, but it will not be done in the name of racial justice. You got to, we have to be kidding ourselves. I mean, racial justice, we talk about an oxymoron in Missouri. I mean, Missouri and in St. Louis, and it pains me to say it, but I mean, 
marijuana policy is the least of the problems of the African American community in Missouri and St. Louis. I mean, we're talking about, this is a town that has a history going back to the Dred Scott decision. It was the last community to integrate, among the last communities to integrate schools, among the in last communities to stop redlining, among the last communities to even integrate its baseball stadium and its baseball team. I mean, my God, you know, and, and to think, if we want to be idealistic, and, and, and sure, Kenneth can set me right, because I got no business speaking for the African American community, Although I am routinely criticized as a racist against white people, and actually I like some white people, but um, <laughs> um, but some of them, yeah, I get along. I, I actually like white people. I, I'll go as far as to say that. But but and I like you know, I mean, really. But but you know, so I'm not going to. I never. I'm trying to speak for the African American community, but I will say, as somebody that's been around here a while and a bit of a dinosaur, uh, if we're holding out any hope that Ferguson is going to help this issue, you know, I, I don't think that's the case. I hope we can, and I've written a lot about things I think we need to do to address systemic racism through some changes in the criminal justice system. And I, again, I don't want to digress too much, but I think that's about creating some permanent structures, the equivalent of what we call civilian review boards, call it, I think I try to soften it in St. Louis Magazine, called civilian public relations boards, or public yeah, c civilian police relations boards, where we actually, we can sit here and talk all the cheap talk we want about racial profiling, which isn't a problem, it's a scourge in St. Louis. We can talk all we want about that issue, we can talk all we want about the, and, and, and again, by the way, Radley put a lot of us in St. Louis to shame with that piece he did in the Washington Post, so, in, in the journalism community, so uh, if you haven't read that, you ought to, because uh, it was a terrific piece. Um, it's stuff I've been saying a long time, a lot of us, but I think it, it really cap encapsulated it better than a lot of us have done. But, but um, I, I really think that we got to recognize that, that um, we've got a long way to go. I hope when we get on the other side of this, whatever it looks like, that we'll be able to, to start systemically having one, among the things we need are, are fewer police departments, which I'm afraid isn't going to happen, with higher standards and for hiring police officers and more diversity and a lot of things that I'm sorry I just wish they would happen but I can't predict that they're gonna happen okay and certainly as far as drug policy goes it's obvious that that and you've heard from the officers who can explain it better than I that, that that the way this needs to be sold to the Republicans who are the ones that matter unfortunately is in terms of personal liberty and in terms of the opportunity cost of of this stupid war, so whatever you want to call it, on drugs, and the opportunity cost of not dealing with violent criminals who do need to be incarcerated because we can't incarcerate them because we're dealing with all this nonsense. So um, that's sort of how I look at the, as far as, as this goes. On a positive note, there are two social trains that seem to have left the station, finally. One has to do, you've heard, the gay marriage issue and the persecution of the LGBT community, which has been going on for um, quite a while now. And that train seems to have left the station. And legalizing marijuana, and I don't mean decriminalizing it, legalizing marijuana is the other social train that, if you followed around the country, uh, has left the station and isn't coming back. Unfortunately, in the first case, LGBT, I believe Missouri is likely to be about the 57th state <laughs> to do anything about it while I'm being cynical. But I think in the case of marijuana policy, perhaps if we are smart enough to realize that the issue must be sold to Republicans, you know, and, and maybe a ballot item in 2016, you know, you never know. I, I actually think that the facts are so overwhelmingly on our side that, you know, I, I hold out hope. And as far as Ferguson, which is, I'm sorry, it was your fine side talk, I'd love to think, and maybe Kenneth can set me right, I'd love to think that this will help us move forward somehow to reform of our criminal justice system, but let me conclude by saying I will believe that when I see it. Thank you.
I'm going to start on kind of the macro level. Hi, my name is Kenny. Thank you all for being here today. It's a really good, a lot of information is getting out good. On the macro level, in politics, I work on a lot of political races and political campaigns. And when President Obama was elected, I heard people use the theme that we're going to live in a post-racial America. Of course, I didn't hear that on conservative talk radio or, or in any real talk radio. And I started thinking, you know, we had a gay president 100 years ago, and James Buchanan in the 1800s, and gay rights have just now started to come around, are, are still fighting. So the theme that the president can change all of society is a myth like a unicorn. So what, so what's happening in Ferguson, and will it really change the climate? Well, how many people, raise your hand if you know the number one cause of death for African-American males ages 14 to 35. It is murder. The number one cause of death for African-American males ages 14 to 35 is murder. As long as that statistic is true, we need all hands on deck. We need everybody fighting to correct that statistic because it is literally costing us the lives of our family, our friends, my nephews, my relatives, and everything like that. That is why Ferguson was a, a powder cake. That is why people got upset. It wasn't just because of the uh, misactions by the police department in Ferguson. It's because we live with the statistic every day, and then on the macro level, we see Missouri politics being, oh, it's an urban versus rural divide. And then we see people on the federal level calling, saying, oh, they're makers and takers, which all seems like racist dog whistle or kind of hidden language that she'll say, it's really those black people's problems. And so we hear the dog whistle all the time in politics. We hear the dog whistle in so many different events, and yet we're wondering when can someone do about it? Because if black people alone, if African Americans could cure racism, we would have done it long time ago. <laughs> so obviously we can't. So not only is the statistic is that so many murder because the war on drugs is part of that murder because you force people into a sub-black economy or underground economy, notice I called it black, uh, underground economy, and that underground economy has turf war competitions and competitions for a street lamp. And some people might shoot because it's the only way they can make money because unemployment in the black community is so much higher than unemployment in any other community. All these statistics keeps adding up. And then you add on top of it that there is a school to prison pipeline. And too many of our black kindergartners get kicked out of kindergarten because they did something that the teacher thought was, oh, he's a little bit violent. And so we start seeing, even with law enforcement, even with education, that it seems like the melanin in our skin is viewed as an escalation of force. I grew up in a community that was nothing like Ferguson. I grew up in a little community called Town and Country, Missouri. <laughs> Not far from where Todd Aiken lives. The only other black family in my community was Lou Brock. <laughs> Every time, my, my, I, I, my father, uh, I grew up the doctor, my mom's a chemist and a teacher, so I grew up in a pretty affluent community. My father bought me a car when I was uh, 16 and <laughs> let me drive it when I was closer to 17. So it was a nice, bright, brand new shot. It was a Chrysler Laser. Everywhere I drove, I was pulled over. How'd you get this car, boy? In Ferguson, I was pulled over because there was a really cute girl in Ferguson I wanted to mention, take her to the Saints roller skating rink. And uh, I was pulled over to ask those questions, look through my car for drugs and things like that. And so it got so bad that I did not want to drive a, bad, a brand new car. Because everywhere I went, I was pulled over for driving while black. This is so common that there is not an African-American male I have met in my lifetime that does not have one story about a bad interaction with law enforcement. Think about that. Think of how that, that paradigm infects a family. Think of how kids on the street no longer play cops and robbers because no one wants to be the cop. <laughs> So the problem is not just race. It is the collusion of race by, like, in Park Hill, Missouri, there's this guy on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, who's the imperial wizard of Clark Hill, Missouri. He's a Ku Klux Klan man. He's putting out these uh, statements saying that when Ferguson happens and the grand jury gives whatever their decision is, that they're going to violently defend their rights and stuff like that. And I want to say, I, I kind of like the Ku Klux Klan because I like dumb racists. <laughs> it's the smart racists that scare me. 
It's the races that have slow policy decisions and put something slightly in a nuanced piece of law that say, oh, well, you know, we need to have, uh, in the city of St. Louis, on this area, you have to pay an extra tax for car admission, but you don't have to pay that admission tax in other parts of Missouri. Oh, that only has to affect the uh, urban community, but that's an urban rural divide thing, which ends up being a tax on black people with cars. So the problem is there's a lot of smart racists out there and there's a lot of systems that make it easy for people to clue with because it's so comfortable to believe that racism is dead. When we look at it in the face from our perspective, and if you, if you want to tell the truth about it, it's not just racist because we're all beings of multiple identity. If you want to talk to women about sexism, you need to have that conversation, but you need to check your male privilege at the door when you have that conversation, because they live with it all the time. It's the same thing around race. You need to check your privilege at the door when you have a conversation with the Ferguson communities and those protesters. There are some things you need to hear from the people on the ground in Ferguson, and this is what they want you to know. A lot of them say, don't keep having a meetings about us without us. That is so important because so many times we get in rooms and we talk about, well, what can we do about those protesters? What can we do about the people on the ground? Well, maybe you can invite them to the conversation. That is one of the systemic problems we have in government, in small communities. The thing that's really changing in Ferguson is there's a new activism that's awakened up. Now we have what I call Twitter detectives. People are starting to look at things and look at paperwork. You know, what Aaron put up earlier about the different uh, law enforcement subgroups, all this information is starting to get out because not only is it easier to get in this internet age, which for a minute, let me put a comment, a flag in that and hold something. Please help us protect net neutrality because all this information is saved by net neutrality. And if you get AT&T and big corporations, then all of a sudden you'll have my podcast on the WGN website will sound like this because they want to slow it down so they can control information. So back to my main topic here. There are so many different needs from the people on the ground in Ferguson that it's hard to capitulate them in one movement. But there is a movement and a lot of people need to be heard. There's a movement about why are so many black men put in prison and why prison looks like slavery 2.0. And why so many people are not only uh, murdered, why so many black men die, why so many black women don't have a family support and things like that. The problems in Ferguson are not just problems caused by one community, are not just problems caused by gentrification. The problems in Ferguson's are old problems caused by every community in America and every community that colludes with racism, whether they know it or not. One of the gifts of privilege is you don't have to know that you're getting benefits from privilege. For instance, I don't know all the benefits I get from being a man in this society. I know I can walk down the street late at night and work, not worried about being raped. I don't often think of that as a privilege. It is. On the other hand, it's often hard to think about your privileges because they come to you so givingly free. And that's what we ask people to check themselves and fight for. So if you want to help Ferguson, start listening. Start going on Twitter and retreating. Start going on Facebook and liking things like that. Social media can help us have a better conversation because we can have a more honest conversation when we're not scared to look each other in the eye. That's how social media can help us some. So when the Ku Klux Klan man posts something, I'm glad because finally I'm getting some real information about, oh, I'm not driving through Park Hill. <laughs> because that guy really is there trying to shoot somebody. So these honest conversations we have, we can have, sometimes it's easier to have them not looking in each other's eye. But we need to move that conversation from the invisible internet to right in the room to solving problems. And the urban-rural divide that is really focused in the Missouri legislature as, you know, Missouri's a Republican state. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, their Democrats exist. But, you know, they're like trying to find hobbits in Missouri right now. <laughs> the thing we must look at is simply who are we leaving out of conversations? And what does it mean when we leave them out of conversation, especially when those conversations are about resources? So I would ask everybody at this Show Me Cannabis uh, conference today not to let marijuana reform happen in a privileged structure. 
because that will just recreate the same thing. It has to be this kind of free market so you can let the poor person that never had a chance at any other industry get right in and start a new industry that could be profitable for all of us. Because if you create another privilege structure, all it's going to be is someone's rich cousin getting richer and income inequality will keep exacerbating. We probably have uh, time for just maybe one question before moving on to the next panel. Dan, sure. We do drug testing. If we catch our employees doing illegal drugs, we take those drugs and test them ourselves. <laughs> if they're any good, we give them hell. <laughs> I love that, by the way. <laughs> and I do not do drug testing on my radio show unless it's with me and my wife at home. <laughs> All right. All right. One more question. Sure. Uh, I just, I'm just concerned about the um, backfire what the protesters and writers person has caused. Another thing, because I do more for Martin preach nonviolence, and also uh, I do hear what you say. I did. I do have bad experience with police. But I am working with my board of aldermen um, to hold police accountable, whether or not the grand jury find a, a, a quit Darren Wilson or not. I would say thank you very much. And it is very important to keep working with your elected officials, no matter what the outcome of the grand jury's decision is. Because the grand jury's decision is one case and one incident. It doesn't talk to the whole movement. The thing we must change, and I'll say this over and over again on my radio show and any place I go, is that statistic that the murder rate between African Americans, especially males, is just too damn high. And I will say that if you think crime in Ferguson was high, go to Kinlock. Go to other places. He mentioned Country Club Hills. Those crime rates are a lot higher than Ferguson, and they're a lot more dangerous. There are places that I could drive you today that you would want to roll up the windows and lock the door by driving through. But the truth is there are still good people in those areas, and some of them are caught in their own birthright place. I was lucky to be born to an affluent family, but that is just the birth lottery. That is not any truth to my integrity of my own character. It doesn't mean I'm better than anyone else, because I'm definitely not. You can ask my wife about that. But I would say, if you want to know what to do after this decision, the first thing you do the night the decision comes down, stay home. Don't go out in the street that night, because only purposeful agitators are going to really be out in the street that night. And there will be some people trying to create chaos that night, because chaos could give them their own kind of fame or infamy, which is a form of fame to a lot of people. I would say after that, meet me on the street the next morning because I'll be carrying a sign protesting no matter what the decision is because even if it is an indictment, there's going to be a trial over that. Now, I pray for a trial because I think the community needs a trial and I would like Attorney and uh, Anthony Gray to get his chance to cross-examine Officer Derek Wilson because that's something people don't always know about. So what you can do also is go on social media and explain the process because a lot of people think or a lot of people allow misinformation to leak out that people start to believe that the grand jury allows the family's attorney to cross-examine the officer and that is not true you do not get that same thing in this, this grand jury and everybody's heard the quote that you can indict a ham sandwich with a uh, with grain well that might not happen this time but when that talking point is out there how must that community feel when you have say, oh, you can any anybody can get an indictment, but you couldn't get one for a dead boy who laid in the street for hours while his mother and his grandmother watched. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would say too is, is, I think it's well. First, it's always dangerous for you know a white journalist from outside the area to give advice to the protesters in Ferguson. Um, but I will say this, I, I, I think as somebody who's been writing about police and, and police misconduct for a long time, um, it's a mistake to sort of, I, I think what happens in a lot of these events, in, in the, these situations is that the, 
um, kind of the social justice movement wraps up their sort of conception of justice based on what happens in this particular case. So if, if Darren Wilson gets indicted, then that's a form of justice. If he's not indicted, then that's a form of injustice. Um, if you remember a while back, there was a video that went around of a South Carolina police officer who had pulled over a, a black man uh, in a gas station, I pulled him over for not wearing his seatbelt, and uh, the officer says, uh, let me see some ID, and the guy reaches into his truck to get his ID, and the officer opens fire on the guy. Um, now, I wrote a response to the, or, or, uh, a piece about that video because a lot of people are saying that this officer needs to be you know, indicted and criminally charged, and maybe he does, but if you watch that video, um, you know, the, the officer's body language is not of a police officer who got out of his car and decided, I'm going to shoot an unarmed black man today. His body language was a guy who was scared to death. Uh, and the reason why is because police officers have been told over and over and over again about the, the inherent danger in traffic stops, the inherent dangers of black men. Um, there is a, uh, what, what was apparent to me in that video is the fact that this police officer had really, really terrible training. Um, you can indict him tomorrow, you can put him, send him, you know, convict him of, I don't know, attempted murder, whatever you want to convict him of, um, put him in prison for the next 20 years, but if you don't, attack that underlying problem, the lack of training, the fact that police lethal force training today, we're used to emphasize de-escalation and conflict resolution overwhelmingly today, and I'm, I'm working on a long article on this, so I, I do kind of know what I'm talking about. Today, the overwhelming emphasis is on how to justify force after you've already used it. Um, so police officers in too many jurisdictions don't get trained on de-escalation anymore. It used to be uh, Norm Stamper, uh, who I interviewed for the book, and actually Neil Franklin, who I interviewed for the book, for my book, um, you know, we mentioned that, you know, it used to be the police officers were told to de-escalate, that if you have to use a significant amount of force, in some ways you should look at it as a failure of your job, because your job is to resolve conflicts without violence. Um, that, 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 is, that, that emphasis is missing today. So whether it's Darren Wilson, whether it's this officer in South Carolina, um, you know, the end of the story should not be whether or not those officers are indicted or convicted, because if you don't address those underlying problems, you're, you're going to see more of these videos, you're going to see more of these stories, the cycle's never going to end. Uh, it really needs to be about more, the more structural issues and about the training. Well, I agree that it's about the long-term issues. That's well said. Um, in this particular case, I've said on TV repeatedly, I'm rooting for an indictment, which has made some of my fellow Caucasians not happy with me. Um, but I think that, and that's different than saying you're rooting for a conviction. Uh, because I think the underlying truth here uh, is that we need this resolved in the public eye with the rules of evidence and cross-examination and so forth. This particular case, in my humble, non, I'm not a lawyer, but in my humble opinion, we as a community and really as a nation need this issue resolved in public. And the combination of a distrusted prosecutor whether by, by a, se a large segment of our community, and, and whether that's justified or not isn't even an issue. The, fa the, com the reality, what I call the trifecta of a, a, a prosecutor who is not trusted with a process that is not trusted, a grand jury process that lawyers will tell you changes from grand jury to grand jury and prosecutor to prosecutor, and it's just completely the opposite of transparent. And then a, a verdict that which we expect that's going to say nothing to see here, move along. Um, that's a really, really ugly trifecta. I, I don't know. As a St. Louisan, a native of St. Louisan also, and I, I fought my way off the streets of Creve Corps. Uh, we were tough. Um, uh, it really pains me. I don't know what the next week or two or three, whatever, I, we're... I, I think most of us are pretty well convinced it's not happening tomorrow, but I don't know what it's going to look like, and, and I'm worried. I mean, I think that, that you know, whatever, you know, to the extent there's looting and that kind of stuff, obviously that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the cause, but people sh can and should be out there assuming there's no indictment. I think they will be out there, and, and I hope to God that they we don't somehow conflate reasoned, reasonable protest, and, and I think justified protest, with, uh, with criminal activity. And I, I, the large majority of people I know, and I talk to a lot of, of African Americans, leaders in the African American community, they, they, none of them, or nobody I've heard is like happy about the, 
kind of spontaneous response that, that leads to the criminal activity. And we can go into all our theories about what causes or whatever, but at the end of the day, we're going to be on the other side of this. And the question I have, and I wish I had more optimism, is whether we're seriously this time going to start understanding that we need to live together and respect one another and treat one another as equals from the top to the bottom of our political process and our institutions. I'd like to think we maybe can move in that direction, but we'll, it remains to be seen.